Hi everyone, um, welcome to Virtual Brain Week for 2022. My name is Megan Mulligan and I am currently a second year PhD student in the uh, Rare Disorder Genetics Lab supervised by Dr. Louise Bicknell um, at the University of Otago and today I'm going to talk to you about my PhD research project which involves understanding the causes of brain disorders in New Zealand children with the hope to find a genetic diagnosis for these families. So to start off, I just want to uh, mention our patients, the sort of children and families we are interested in studying. So these patients have a reduced head size. So if you look at the picture here, um, we have a baby with a typical head size, and to the right of that, we have a child with a reduced head size, also known as microcephaly, like I said, and then even further than that, we can have uh, babies with severely reduced head size, which you can see the comparison compared to the babies with the and the dotted dashed line as to where the typical head size would be. Some of our patients also have uh, intellectual disability as well as developmental delay, meaning that these children aren't meeting their developmental milestones, whether that's talking, crawling, walking, uh, things like that. Some of our patients also are on the autism spectrum and some also have seizures. So not all patients have every single um, one of these characteristics, but some can have uh, say reduced head size and developmental delay together. So I want you to start by thinking of our genome as a library. And in our genome library, as you will see in the picture on the right, it is made up of, um, made up of lots of books. And in these books, if we were to open one, we would see that our genome is made up of billions of letters. A's, G's, T's and C's repeated all throughout, as you can see on the left. So my job in my PhD research is to go through these books through a single chapter to find a single sentence and look for a single spelling mistake. And that is very difficult. It's almost compared to like looking for a needle in a haystack. Sometimes you don't even know where to start. Um, you just have to start somewhere. So as I mentioned, we are looking for the single spelling mistake in the DNA. So here's an example of what I would look like, uh, what I would look like, what I would look at during my um, research is I would look at what is called a reference sequence. And so as you can see at the top, there is a reference sequence, which this sequence occurs um, in the general population. And as you can see, it's the A's, G's, T's and C's. And then if we look underneath, we have our mutation sequence, whereby um, if you can see um, there's a G that is underlined in our mutation sequence, that G has then turned to a T. And it's these mutations that cause these brain, dis brain disorders within the children uh, that we study. So that might seem very terrifying for people who don't look at um, DNA sequence all the time, so I thought I'd bring this into a sort of real world example of um, how you might want to look at this. So here we have our reference sequence or our reference sentence. So we can think back to our book. Our genome is our book made up of letters which encode sentences. And so here we have a sentence that says, Jack has eaten all of the cake. And so you can see that they're in blue. But surrounding the blue words, there is this black, uh, black nonsense, I guess, letters, um, which is also referred to as junk DNA. So in the human body, this junk DNA is normally removed to make uh, the sentences make sense. So you can see that when we remove this junk DNA, we can now clearly read the sentence, Jack has eaten all of the cake. So that's our reference sequence. We then have uh, changes within our bodies that are called neutral changes. So as you can see here, the has, the S at the end of the word has, has changed to a D. So now the sentence read, reads, Jack had eaten all of the cake. Now this sentence still makes sense despite having a spelling mistake in the sentence. This, these neutral changes, uh, these changes are neutral, sorry, because they don't change the sentence, they only change a letter. And so these changes are found in the general population and we're expected to have many of these as these are the changes in the DNA that make us unique from one another. We then have our mutation changes, whereby you can see at the end of the sentence here, the word cake has been changed to tack, which if you read the sentence now, Jack has eaten all of the tack, the sentence no longer makes sense. And it, this is because this word, the spelling mistake has completely changed the meaning of the sentence. It is these type of mutations that are occurring in these children with brain disorders that we are interested in studying. 
So to be able to look at these, um, to find these spelling mistakes, look for these uh, changes in the DNA, I use DNA sequencing technology such as exome and genome sequencing. And so exome sequencing might sound like a really scary word for people who don't think about it all the time. But if we break it down and think back to our book, our bookcase, all of our books of our genome, we have a book. We have a single book. We can open that book and there'll be chapters in the book. Exome sequencing is just like looking at the chapters of the book. So you're not looking at the entire book, you're just looking at a select few chapters that make the machinery for our body. And so to do exome sequencing, we often get DNA from the patient as well as both the mum and the dad. By doing this, it allows us to um, get an idea of how this spelling mistake or mutation might have been inherited, whether it has come from mum, whether it has come from dad, whether it had come maybe from both parents or whether it had just occurred by chance. So once we get our patient DNA as well as our parental DNA, we then take our DNA samples, which usually come from blood, and send them away for sequencing. So these um, DNA samples go through the sequencer, where the sequencer reads the DNA sequence, reads out all of those A's, G's, T's and C's, produces a huge amount of data, even though it's only from a few chapters of the book, it's still a lot of data. We then take this data, which we put through our computer programs, which then decides whether there is a spelling mistake, so a difference from the reference compared to the um, patient DNA sample. And so once that's happened, um, I get this massive uh, file of all of these spelling mistakes, remembering that these could be those neutral changes that we see in the population, as well as the mutation changes as well. My job is then to filter through all of this and determine whether it's a neutral change, one that we would commonly see, or whether this change is uh, likely to cause the disorder in the child. However, sometimes exome sequencing might not give you the answer, which is when we need to use genome sequencing. So you'll remember I said exome sequencing, we're only looking at particular chapters in the book. So when we do genome sequencing, we grab that entire book, all the books off the shelf, we open the book and we read everything. So you can't expect to just read a few chapters of the book and expect to know everything by the time you get to the end of the book. And that's sort of the same for exome sequencing, which is why we might do genome sequencing. Another reason we might do genome sequencing is that sometimes we might not have any parental DNA. Uh, this might be for a number of reasons, such as the parents might now be deceased or they just choose not to take part in the study. And so here's just a few examples um, from my PhD so far. So sometimes we can be very, very confident about a spelling mistake. So here we have um, a New Zealand family where they have a child who has reduced head size and they're also quite short. Um, and this um, image here on your left is just a way that we can visualize and look at the DNA sequence. So we have uh, DNA from the child and both the mother and the father. And each one of these individual peaks represents an individual letter of the, of the DNA. And so I just want you to focus in on the red box, which I've um, zoomed in on on the right of the image. And as you can see for the child, they have two letters at uh, that particular position in their DNA. They have a G and a T, when you would only expect one letter. Um, so they have a copy of the reference, but they also have a copy of a spelling mistake. And if we look further, we can look at the mother who also has one copy of the reference and one copy of the spelling mistake. But if you look at the father, you can see that he only has the reference G. This shows that the uh, spelling mistake in the child has been inherited from the mother. And not always um, uh, mutations or spelling mistakes this easy to find, but one thing that helped me become very confident in this spelling mistake is that uh, researchers from uh, over the world also have patients who have reduced head size, also have some short stature, quite small patients. They have similar uh, spelling mistakes or the same spelling mistake in this gene as we do in our patient. So that led me to conclude that I was very confident that this spelling mistake was causing the disorder in our child. However, like I said, things aren't always that easy and sometimes the spelling mistakes are much less clear. So I found a particular spelling mistake in one of our patients who again has a reduced head size, um, but there was very little published about it. Not many uh, researchers around the world or in New Zealand um, had written much about it or know much about it. 
So I wasn't confident that the spelling mistake uh, was causing the disorder, but it looked promising enough for me to investigate further. So you can carry out experiments in the lab to see if this particular spelling mistake is causing the disorder in this child. And so to do this, I first had to make a prediction. Uh, my prediction was that this particular spelling mistake in this individual might not cut out the junk DNA. So again, if we revert back to uh, our reference sentence in the beginning of the uh, presentation, where Jack has eaten all of the cake, normally, as I said, the uh, junk DNA will be removed, it'll be cut out from the sequence, and the, sequence will be read, uh, the sentence will be read clearly. However, I think this particular spelling mistake is not cutting out the junk DNA properly. So you can see that we start off with the sentence being cut out properly, and then a bit of junk DNA is not included, the sentence is cut out normally again, and then a bit more junk DNA, which would in turn um, have an impact on the development of the child. So I went into the lab and carried out some experiments to see if um, I thought the spelling mistake was not um, allowing the junk DNA to be cut out as well. And so here in this image on the right is just another way that we can visualise DNA. So on the far left, we have a sizing marker, and this lets me know um, what approximate size of my DNA sequence or fragment it is. And then on the next two columns, we have both the reference sequence and the uh, spelling mistake found in our patient. And so these big two bright white bands are down the bottom there. These are the DNA bands, and as you can see, they look pretty much identical which suggests that this particular spelling mistake is not causing the d this disorder in the child. Um, if we were expecting this to be causing um, the disorder, we would expect that the size of the um, spelling mistake fragment would be slightly different as those junk DNA pieces would be included, making the size of the DNA bigger. However, that was not the case, and from this I concluded that it is likely that this particular spelling mistake is a neutral change, so one of those changes that is likely to be seen in the general population. So what next? When we identify a spelling mistake in, in an individual in a New Zealand family, what do we do now? So first of all, we want to start by asking a few questions, like what are these spelling mistakes doing? We want to know what the function of the gene is, um, also what sort of machinery within the body our sentence will code for. This will help give us an idea of what might, being dis what might be being disrupted um, if we know this sort of information. But it also brings up the questions about uh, when you disrupt the sequence, how does it affect the brain cells within the child, but also the child's overall development. And again, we can carry out experiments in the lab to help us answer these questions. And so I'm fortunate enough to be uh, able to use brain cells as a model to test whether these spelling mistakes are causing the disorder. So we have a cell line called a neural progenitor cell line, which I'm able to grow in the lab in one of the dishes. And basically a neural progenitor cell um, allows you to look at early stages of development. And what's really cool about these cells is that you can um, give them a few, I guess, if we want to talk about it in terms of the real world, you can give them some snacks and then they'll turn into neurons, which will help us look at later stages of development. And by doing this, we can either track how the um, spelling mistake is disrupting the child's development over time from the early stages to the late stages, or how it affects a particular stage of development. Um, another thing that's really cool about these is that we can actually introduce our own spelling mistakes to replicate what we might see in the child, or we can also delete the entire sentences from the book and see what that does to the cells. So lastly, I just want to talk about why I think it's so important to identify these spelling mistakes. So firstly, uh, I think a really important thing is you're able to help families. So it can give families answers as to why their child has the genetic disorder they do. Um, with these genetic brain disorders that we study, they're often so rare that um, our patients are the only, only family in New Zealand to have this spelling mistake. Um, so there's not a lot of information on how the future may look for their child. So by being able to um, talk to our international collaborators and network, we're able to find other children who have similar spelling mistakes in the gene from overseas and then bring this information back to New Zealand where we can um, then give the patient and their family a better idea of how their future may look. 
And the second is to better understand biology, in particular how the brain develops. So there's a lot still currently unknown about the brain development and how um, humans develop in general. We are making progress, but there's always progress to be made. Um, so I think these are two, the two reasons why it's very important for my PhD research to be looking for these spelling mistakes within New Zealand families and children who have um, brain disorders. Um, lastly, I just want to do a few acknowledgements. So I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Louise Bicknell, as well as the Bicknell Lab for helping me with some of my lab experiments, as well as the University of Otago for funding me through a doctoral scholarship and the Neurological Foundation, who also fund some of this research, as well as the clinicians, patients and families, as it, this wouldn't be possible without them. Thank you for listening. <laughs>